All right, how's it going, y'all? Today we're back in Synology's DSM-7 beta, and this time we're testing out that new SSD cache that they've unveiled. It is supposed to be a lot more stable, a lot faster, and overall just work a lot better compared to the old version. I will say I was not super impressed by the old SSD cache because I found it was just a pain to set up and honestly did not give me that good of performance. Plus, I had heard some things about people losing data using a read-write cache. So I'm really excited to see this because I've heard really good things about the new update. Another really big feature that they've introduced in DSM-7 with the SSD cache is now you no longer have to take your volume offline to set up the SSD cache. That is huge. That means you can swap it out, do something else, and not interrupt your users, which is really important, especially for people who are using an SSD cache. Most people using an SSD cache are gonna be businesses, and so that's where it's really important. So another thing that's happening, and this is not from DSM-7, this is just Synology, is Synology is including a lot more slots for M.2 caching on their newer NASes, even for smaller models. And the reason that this is so great is because NVMe M.2 drives can be so fast in sequential performance that it doesn't even matter about SSD caching for single user performance. Two of them can pretty easily outpace an eight drive RAID. That means that even if you are just a single user, you can get performance benefits by using NVMe caching just because the data on there will be so fast, even if you're not using ultra high IOPS, you're still going to be getting data faster, only if you have a 10 gigabit slot on there. If you're running one gigabit, it's only gonna help for a ton of random reads, but if you've got 10 gigabit and your drives are preventing you from being able to saturate a 10 gigabit connection, you can pretty easily throw a M.2 NVMe SSD cache on there and it will immediately be able to saturate a 10 gigabit connection all by itself. So any data that was on that SSD cache, you'll be getting at speeds that completely saturate a 10 gigabit connection. So you might have a bottleneck elsewhere, but overall it's starting to make a lot more sense. Back in the day when it was primarily just two and a half inch SSD caching, it was actually not good to use SSD caching if you're gonna be doing sequential reads. That was because generally, even if you had one or two SSDs, it would generally be outpaced by a multi-disc RAID. That's because as you add more drives and you have a lot of hard drives, your read speeds multiply especially. So if you had an SSD cache, it could actually be slower than your sequential reads from the hard drive array itself. But now with NVMe M.2 drives, it is just completely night and day. They're three or four times faster in sequential reads generally. And so it is so much faster and makes a lot more sense. All right, so one additional thing I found in DSM-7 under Storage Manager, which I was really surprised by, is they've got now the ability to performance test a hard drive. Apparently this was a feature on the XS and XS Plus series, but it was not on the lower models. Well now apparently with DSM-7, I've not seen this talked about anywhere, they've got the option in the menu to either do a hard drive or an SSD speed test. And it does a full on performance test. It takes about 18 minutes, so I've got one running now, but I'm really interested to see what it looks like. All right, so there's just one thing I wanna do before we start setting up the SSD cache in DSM-7, and that's to actually do a performance test of the SMB pool beforehand. And so we're not gonna be doing the standard Blackmagic speed test that I like to use so much, because that is a sequential test, which SSD caching in this case is not gonna help us too much. Instead, what we're gonna be doing is a random read and write test. And so I found amorphous disk test on the Mac store that does just that. It is a ton like Crystal Benchmark, which is used a ton in the PC world for testing random read and writes on drives. And I've been testing it out and it seems to give really accurate numbers. So I'm happy to use that and I'm gonna start using it more often. All right, so we're just gonna go into my desktop, and as you can see right here, I've already mounted the drive over SMB, and this is all over a one gigabit connection on my DS718 Plus, and currently has one old three terabyte shucked drive that is not a very good drive, and so it's really going to exaggerate the performance test we can get out of SSD caching. Basically, this is the worst possible scenario for a hard drive. It is old, it is slow, and it is just a single drive. And so it's a perfect candidate for SSD caching. All right, so now I'm just gonna go ahead and pull up Amorphous Disk Test, which is what I've been using. And as you can see, I've been benchmarking my free NAS build. And so now we're just going to select first. And we're going to run the test. It is going to take quite a while, 
but it runs a ton of different tests. It runs sequential read and write tests. It runs different Q depths for basically testing the different performance you can get out of the drive for different sizes. So it's essentially grabbing smaller and smaller files every single time and writing them and testing how it works there. And it overall does a really good job. It writes some, waits a little bit, and then goes. So as you can see right here, we are saturating that one gigabit connection with the sequential read test, which is what we expect. Even a single hard drive, almost no matter how old it is, is going to be able to saturate a single gigabit connection in a sequential write and read. All right, so now this is gonna take a few minutes to run, so we'll go ahead and flash forward to the test being completed. All right, so now we're finally done running and we can start talking about what these numbers mean really quickly. So basically these top two are what's called sequential tests. Basically when I ask for a file, I then ask for the next file right after it. And so that's a sequential read. So that's what you're gonna be doing if you're transferring really large files. And so for a hard drive, that is perfect. Hard drives really like sequential reads because that's how the head works. The head is spinning and so when you ask for the next file, the head is going to be there right after. Then these next two are random tests and they've got different queue depths. I'm not going to go over that. It's basically how many operations it's requesting. And as you can see, the queue depths changing doesn't really change much at all for a random test on a hard drive because the entire time that disk head is just spinning back and forth, back and forth, waiting to get to what it needs to grab. And so we can see that when we're randomly reading files from the disk, we're only able to read about 1.5 megabytes per second, which is incredibly slow, but you're never going to be randomly reading this many files. It's just a good way to see a performance of the drive. I'll go ahead and save this real quick. And if we look over here with the writes, we're not gonna pay too much attention to that because as you can see, they're much higher. That's because these writes were actually first written to RAM. And so it was saying, hey, yeah, we're good. Send the next one on. So don't take too much heed with this. We're really gonna be looking at the read speeds. And another thing to think about is you very rarely are ever doing random writes unless you've got a lot of people connecting all at once. Really, random reads are your most common thing because that's stuff, something like scrubbing through a timeline, going through a bunch of photos, and all those things that are accessing a bunch of different files all across the disk. And we can actually also see that we can see these in IOPS, and so we'll save that as well. All right, so now that I've got those saved, we can use those to compare it later on. So I'll give you a long story short, this is very poor performance if you're something like a video editor or somebody who's trying to access a lot of random files or you've got multiple people connecting. This is going to be really, really slow and your server is going to feel like it's hanging all the time. And so that's where an SSD cache comes in. And so now let's go into DSM-7 and set up our SSD cache. It is incredibly easy to do. First off, just go into DSM-7 and go into Storage Manager. Then from Storage Manager, go down to HDD SDD and select Manage Available Drives. But before we do that, I wanted to show you all the ability to do the performance test, which I thought was really interesting and was not in DSM-6. So you just go into Action and click Benchmark and it shows you a benchmark of the drive. And so it gives you both the read and the write throughput and IOPS. And so IOPS are what we saw there later on. And that's a really common metric for random read and write. And so as you can see, it's got a very fast throughput for reading, which is really common with an SSD. All right, and so I'm not gonna run that test now because it takes a really long time to run, but I just thought that was interesting. I thought I'd show y'all. So now we're actually gonna go ahead and set up that SSD cache on our device. So we're gonna go in and say manage available drives. And it's got a super easy setup. We can say, oh look, you've got an extra drive. What do you wanna do with it? And we're gonna say we would like to create an SSD cache. And now we get to choose where to mount it. I've only got volume one and what type of cache it is. There's read write or there's read only. Read write basically allows you to send writes to it, which means you need at least a RAID one, which means you need at least two drives on there to protect yourself from fault tolerance. That's only gonna be good if you find yourself running into a lot of problems writing a ton of data to the drives, or if you have a bunch of people trying to read and write to it, Otherwise, I'd really recommend only doing a read-only cache. It's a lot more stable and not gonna cause you any issues. And so since I've only got one SSD in here, we're gonna do a read-only cache and select that. And now we're gonna click Next. And now it's gonna give us how we would like to set up the RAID type. Since there's only one, we can only do basic. But if you had multiple drives, you could set it up as RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, something like that. 
if you're doing read only, don't do anything other than RAID 0 because there's no reason having fault tolerant unless you're doing a ton of random reads on a very small subset of data. Otherwise, it's just not worth it at all. I, you'd much rather have a larger cache than have all the cache twice. So we're gonna choose basic, that's the only option we have, and we're gonna select it. Capacity, maximum. That is one other thing to remember. If you do set up an SSD cache, it actually has to index it in RAM. Otherwise, it'd be incredibly slow. And so it does take up some RAM. It's not a ton unless you get a really large SSD cache, but it's just something to remember. And now we're just gonna go ahead and create it. And look, just like that, it happened. We didn't shut down our volume. Everything just kept running and it was like nothing ever happened. We now just have a read SSD cache. It is a huge performance benefit compared to what it used to be. It used to be this awful experience where the entire pool would have to go offline. It would take like 10 minutes. It was a really clunky system anytime you're editing the SSD cache. Now it's just like, okay, here's an SSD cache. You're going. That's a really big benefit in DSM-7. We go into volume, we can see it's right here. All right, and so now we can go back in and let's test the drives again. And so once again, we didn't have to remount the volume, we didn't have to do anything. Everything just carried over, which is completely different than it was in DSM-6. So now I'm just gonna do this test again. And once again, I'll see after it's done. All right, and so real quick, I did do something stupid. I accidentally reran the test. So I had to go back through the screen recording and get the clip from the actual one. And so I'm going to change it up now. And also we're gonna talk about why these tests were not actually perfect for this, but overall were somewhat better than what I did previously. All right, and so on our screen to the left here is the pre-test and the post-test before the SSD cache and after the SSD cache. And so we can see that they're actually very, very, very similar. And I realize I did not do this test as I should have done. And I still don't know a good methodology for testing an SSD cache that gives real numbers. It is really difficult to test because it really relies on the fact that on average, data is gonna be accessed multiple times, especially over and over and over again. And so Amorphous Disk Mark 3.1 did not do that. It instead basically wrote the data once and then was reading it randomly. You can actually see on this post test that happening because it started off with almost the exact same read speeds. But as the test went on, every single time it did another one, it actually got a little bit faster. And I'll show that on the screen here. It just slowly increased. And so that really shows how the SSD cache works. The first time you access a file, it doesn't matter because it's not in the SSD cache yet. But as you're accessing the file over and over and over again, that's when it's loaded into the SSD cache, which is really common to happen on your actual NAS, but it does not happen that often in a disk speed test. I really need to find a better testing methodology for these. So if you know of any, please put those in the comments below. I really would love to be able to get good benchmarking data out of SSD caching because I think it can really help a lot of people and be able to actually show how good something is. But overall, unfortunately, these test metrics did not go as well as I hoped they would. I was also watching in the DSM-7 UI, and I was seeing that the SSD cache was never used in the beginning, and so it had a zero hit rate, which was unfortunate. But overall, I have used SSD caching in DSM-6, and it really helped out my random read and writes with something like Final Cut. The latency was so much better once the project was loaded in the SSD. And so scrubbing through the timeline was so much faster just because it has all of those random reads and it didn't have to wait for every single one of the hard drives in the RAID to find the file. Instead, it just had to wait for the one SSD to go, oh, yep, I've got it right there. And so I do think SSD caching has a benefit, but I really need to figure out how to test it better. And overall, DSM-7 has made adding an SSD cache so much easier than it used to be. It was terrible, your entire volume went down, you had to shut down all your virtual machines. It was just a really awful experience and now they've made it work just so much better. All right, well I think that's gonna be it for this tutorial. Go ahead and leave any other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below. And if you wanna hire me, I've got a link for that in the description. All right, have a good one, bye.